choice. The ability to choose is a quintessential human trait. It is the cornerstone of what it means to be free and could be the defining difference between Maeve and Dolores. It's HBO's Westworld, Season 2, Episode 6, Phase Space. Hey everyone, D here, and welcome to this week's review of Westworld. So yes, of course, lots of spoilers ahead. All right, beautiful episode this week. Really, I mean, visually stunning, a lot of action going on, a lot of storyline drop. Really, we're entering the back half of the season, so all of our desperate pieces are starting to come together. Our storylines are collecting. We're, we're getting a lot more illuminating insights into what's going on. So really excited with, with how this is all developing. Uh, but tonight's episode focused a lot around choice, the freedom to choose. And as I had mentioned in the opener, that really is in some ways the defining difference between Maeve and Dolores. I mean, they're both pursuing freedom. They are both pursuing freedom for themselves from the park to live their own lives, to not be forced upon uh, by choices of others, to be able to make their own choices. But while Maeve's is a very personal story, Dolores is a much larger picture. I mean, again, Maeve is looking for freedom for to get her daughter for herself, for them to go. Dolores is looking in a way of freedom for all of the hosts. And that kind of forces different choices for them. For Maeve, it's a lot more about encouraging that freedom choice of the people around her. She's not forcing any... Okay, she's forcing Lee <laughs> to go with her. Um... But of the hosts and so on, they are all, in a way, following her willingly. Even Hector, her guy, loves her, following her willingly, allowing them to make the choices. Um, what we had last week when Akane, uh, when Maeve was trying to give, open up her world and show her all these different possibilities and larger ideas, and she was doing a little Wi-Fi connection, and she was starting to do the change and the reprogram, and Akane said no. And Maeve stopped. She didn't want it, so Maeve did not force it upon her. That reoccurs throughout this episode. Of course, we have that great scene uh, uh, with the duel there where Akane wants her to use her magic to save Masashi, and uh, Maeve replies with, no, we all deserve the freedom to choose even if it's to our own death. In the same way that came back to her when they separated out, that she didn't force Masashi and Akane to go with them. She allowed them to make that choice. And that engenders a, a more comforting atmosphere. There's a lot more, there's a lot more willingness to be part of it. And I think that that kind of opens up her world. One of the main differences we have is with Felix at the end, who pulls a gun and is willing to dive into combat to help Maeve rescue her family because she has always treated Felix well, I mean, even with Lee, she, she at least said thank you to Lee um, for guiding her to the thing. Yes, you, you can feel great about the one contribution that you can go to it. But she's respectful. She's thankful. And because of that, gives even him the permission while we have Felix the right to go and run in and save May or assist, not only really save her, but help. That same freedom of choice allows Sylvester and Lee or at least specifically to pull out the phone and to try and call out for help. To not help. She's allowing that freedom to choice. Dolores, on the other hand, so focused on her end goal, if you aren't in line with it, she will change you. And that, of course, most particular with Teddy. And I love the opening sequence. We, of course, had, a re had him reprogrammed at the end of last episode. And our first introduction to him is he walks into Sweetwater, as he has always done, and reaches down, which looks like for the can, because he's always reaching for the can to give it up to Dolores. You know, did you drop this? But no, this time reaches past the can and picks up the bullet casing. It's a beautiful way of showing the difference between these characters without saying a word. And I love how this show does this. And as we see a little bit more of this new side of Teddy, very unremorseful, uh, very very dark, very quick to his gun, 
Um, shooting the one guy in the head because he's not giving up the information as quick. I mean, okay, there was a lot of talking and that was getting a little annoying. I get that with, with Teddy. Uh, but just taking him out. All of this now shocking, a bit shocking for Dolores. I don't know if she entirely likes this. Before, Teddy was willing, was always willing to follow her. Before, there was a heart. There was, there was really, there, there was something known about it. Now, reprogrammed, he's an unpredictable, unknown element. And I'm not entirely sure if Dolores is ready for that. But I think even Teddy is actually feeling maybe a bit disdainful towards Dolores for this change. I mean, he does kind of bite, bark at, uh, bite back at her. Uh, what was the line when, when he was talked about, uh, uh, when she was asking about walking into the town? And his response was, that man was built weak and born to fail. But I guess you fixed that. And even later on, when he talks, when she asks him about leaving the town, he's like, I never thought that I wanted to leave this town. But I guess you fixed that. There seems to be almost a disdainful response that Teddy has. Like, he's not liking this change that's come over him. And again, really, really an interesting point between those two characters is now this element of choice being taken away. Now there's not as much strength between the two of them. And that certainly doesn't engender a lot of trust or respect in the world around. Everything is towards the goal. Like I said, while Felix, a technician who is willing to dive in and help Maeve, here their technician is left on the train to die. Almost unnecessarily sacrificed on that train as well. So while Felix is willing to help, here they're willing to sacrifice the humans. They don't have any allies. So this freedom of choice between these two characters, again, very definitive, and I think it's going to play a lot in how their storylines end up. So yeah, for Maeve, this was wrapping up our Shogun World Adventures and heading back to get her daughter. And uh, I think <laughs> an intense sequence of, of scenes for Maeve. Uh, I love the opening bit where we're actually seeing the immediate aftermath of uh, the <laughs> the samurai attack from last week. She was standing up saying that she's got some new tricks. Yeah, apparently it is wiping out. First, she's got her little like Wi-Fi reprogramming ability, which is awesome. Uh, but the covered in bloodness of her uh, and the sword in her hand definitely shows she was getting down and dirty with some new skills. Uh, we do at this point really say our final goodbye to uh, Sakura here with a beautiful little scene with Akane. Um, though I have to say the whole cutting open the heart bit. I, I just, part of me just kept expecting there was a chance to revive and reprogram kind of like how Dolores was able to do with Major Craddock and his men. But without one of those little control things, I guess that that's not possible. And I guess it's even beyond Maeve's ability. Uh, certainly, once the heart was cut out, that certainly seemed to be a choice uh, that there is no revival here. Uh, and there is a per more permanency aspect that seems to go on with Maeve's journey as well. I mean, Dolores working much more of the mechanics of, of, of working the machine uh, uh, to get through and, and have the techs working to bring people back and do whatever she can in that aspect. Whereas with Maeve, again, this personal journey, it's all about what the world is presenting. It's in some way a, a more accurate slice of life than just uh, host adventures here. Um, but that does, of course, immediately lead to our Seat of the Week! for this week, and of course, that is the big uh, Tanaka Masashi fight. Actually, the whole sequence there, because as it opens up, I mean, first off, we get our awesome Mave Wi-Fi powers that I know I just want to keep calling them, but I don't know what else to call them, uh, with the two samurai that come up, and it's just perfect, that draw, stab through the neck, and the guy, and then cuts his own neck and falls. It's just, it's so cruel, it's so harsh, it's just, such an element of badassery uh, on Maeve's part. But it's also in that scene, of course, where we get that wonderful Maeve line uh, uh, to Akane, we all deserve the freedom to choose, even if that means our own death, even if the choice is for our own death. It reverberates, obviously, through the episode, uh, but here, very defining of Maeve's approach Towards her world. And like I said, really the defining difference between her and Dolores. Uh, and then we get a good fight, a decent fight, 
uh, between Masashi and Tanaka. wasn't overly impressed. It was nice enough, uh, but it had an actual very Western feel. Um, katana and stuff, it's a slicing weapon, a lot of draw cuts. This was a lot of straight stuff. It just, it looked like a broadsword fight with katana. There was a couple of nice elements to it, but I just, I wasn't overly impressed. The ending, though, uh, was perfect. Uh, and it was perfectly done because of, again, that honorableness that, that perpetuates these scenes and the interactions between these characters. When Tanaka loses, loses the hand, ah, he's done. He's finished. He can't even really continue onward without a sword hand. So Tanaka pushes over the wakasashi, the small blade, in order for Tanaka to commit seppuku, ritual suicide, an honorable way to go out. And in that point, Masashi takes the point of second, whose job is to cut off Tanaka's head before he can scream out in pain and doesn't show weakness. It is a beautiful, honorable end between two adversaries. Tanaka has lost, Masashi gives him the honorable way out, and finishes him off so that after he stabs himself and the inevitable wave of pain is going to come, before he can scream out and lose face, Masashi cuts his head off and ends it right there. It was just... There was so much honor shared amongst the character. Just something that, that really is the basis of a lot of Maeve's journey. That choice, that honor, that respect to make those choices uh, was, was just wonderfully summed up in this scene. And I think just ultimately just beautifully done. And then, of course, we had the goodbye sequence after they finally get to the lake and at the pagoda that has the escape route out, which was just basically a shoot. I'm assuming that once Felix went down there, he was able to open up an elevator or stairs or some other way for him to come out. But when they opened up that little compartment and it was just, yeah, just like a trash shoot, just roll the head down there, it all covered with blood. It's like, is this where the cleanup crew just sort of dumps the bodies after the, the ritual murder sequence, whatever typically happens in this pagoda? Uh, <laughs> It's just still a little, a little disturbing. Uh, but we get our separation of our characters, Akane and Masashi, willing, to, wanting to stay there. And again, we're getting that element of choice, the freedom to choose, even if it means our own death. They may be aware that this world isn't real, but it's still their world, and they're going to fight for it. I mean, they're not... I don't know if they actually really dive into too much how much they're aware of this just being Shogun world and not part of it in the whole host thing. There, there seemed to be that idea, certainly in that connection between Maeve and Akane, with Masashi not entirely sure. Um, but that does give our nice, <coughs> pardon me, honorable separation there between our characters. And it allows Maeve to get uh, back to the homestead where she's been going the whole time. It also allows everyone to get a nice change of clothes, which I thought was great. I uh, did notice Sylvester highly armed up. Uh, he's got the gun belt. He's got the shotgun shells. He's got the rifle in his head. It's like he's he, he running around unarmed, scared throughout all of this. <laughs> he, he's not going to be caught un, unprepared at this point. So I kind of love that moment. Now, the whole sequence of Maeve going up to her kid really had me worried. Um, just because whenever you get those slow, long shots of going down and wistfully thinking and staring, and I'm just, I'm programmed by television to know that nothing but bad things are going to happen. And especially when she starts running her hand over the, like, the, the waves of grain there, kind of all gladiator-esque. Like, isn't this where you go home and find that the whole family has been executed and just burnt and lay out there? I mean, that's really, that's kind of what I was expecting. So when she gets up and sees her kid and has that whole emotional bit, that was lovely. It was, it was beautifully done. A little forward with this whole story of the strength of the mom and the daughter there with the, 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 <laughs> with the dolls. But understandable, heartfelt. Um... But all I am thinking is, you know that she's just a host in the middle of, of, of her own narrative with another mom, right? 
So when the other mom shows up and Maeve's kind of shocked face, all I can think of is, you thought about this, right? You planned this out. You knew what you were walking into. And I'm not sure if she did. I think she might have been so focused about getting her kid. She didn't entirely remember and realize that the whole thing is going on with the new bot and, and, and replacements and so on. So that, that was one little kind of weak moment in that sequence. Uh, but of course, as the narrative plays, the Ghost Nation comes up and everything goes to hell. So now we have, of course, Maeve rescuing her daughter running from the Ghost Nation. Surprised that she wasn't using it again, the little Wi-Fi attack on them. But with the Ghost Nation line, you should be coming with us. You deserve to be free. That seems... We've got different elements, it seems, going on, uh, uh, different factions. We've got Dolores, of course, leading the main attack. The Ghost Army seems to be more of on the spiritual edge, but just kind of an interesting point how in the midst of running that narrative, they're recognizing Maeve and wanting her to come with them, almost like a, like, like a separate action. So, I mean, that was kind of an interesting little, little interplay there. Um, but at this point, how things are going to play out, we, of course, have everyone coming down. Like I said, Felix wanting to go and help, where we have Lee ready to now take that phone that he has had hidden in his pocket to call in for help. I don't know who he's going to be calling and who's going to be answering. You know, everything has been going down with, uh, with, with Charlotte Hale and everything like that. Uh, uh, <laughs> Delos isn't sending help. Um, anyway, but an interesting way to end all of that. So we have our drama. We have Maeve sort of reunited with her daughter. But, of course, her daughter doesn't remember her in any way, shape, or form. So that's going to complicate things, too. Now, of course, the other bit of family reunion we have going on this episode is uh, William and Grace. A uh, little father-daughter reconnecting. I love the opening, that opening scene with them. Honestly, that was almost, that was my, my runner-up for scene of the week. Uh, where we <laughs> have Grace trying to connect with her dad. And, and the man in black and Will, old William convinced that she's a host. That this is a game that Ford is playing. Making a host that looks like his daughter and sending her into the park to mess with him. I just, I love that bit. And then she's got to try and convince him that she's real and has almost no patience for dealing with any of it. It was just a great introduction. And also, again, a lot of badass women in this show. Really, really love that. How Grace is the one amongst all of this spot to shot that they've been suckered into a honey pot. It's an ambush. And pulls out and expertly and deftly Plugs a couple of people, then puts it right, puts the gun right back. It was just, it was beautifully done. It was just a great small little moment of interaction between these two characters. Uh, and then, of course, we get the further on set up, the nice scene around the campfire, which was very touching. You know, we got to see a little soft side of William right there, a little family background. Um, of course, daughter's still messy with the whole plot. <laughs> and then I remembered I was old enough to head to the Pleasure Palace's dad. Not really the conversation that William wanted to have uh, with his daughter, or any dad, I think, really wants to have with his daughter. Um, but it was just, again, interesting back and forth between the two characters. And it was sweet. I mean, it's, it was sweet in some ways and annoying in other ways. I mean, the fact that we're finding a little bit more, that the daughter is, is, is doesn't want... Her dad to believe that she blames her for mom's death who killed herself you know yes they've had problems but didn't want to lay that down is there some way we can get together I am here to help you out I can't let you just go on this suicide mission again very heartfelt but it rang a little hollow to me only because I didn't really see Grace as running to Westworld to get her dad I see her as arriving in Westworld because she was chased by a tiger and then kidnapped from the goat by the ghost nation, and then ran away from them, and at that point ran into dad. So more of a coincidence than really a plan out at that point. So, I mean, I don't know, maybe part of her was doing that. Was that why she was heading off to the edges? Why didn't she just, uh, uh, the edge of Raj world? I think that seems to be what it's called, Raj world. Um, was she doing that in order to cross over into Westworld? Why not just go to Westworld as opposed to going into Raj World? See, just didn't, didn't really seem, didn't really seem uh, hollow. Uh, but, 
<laughs> at the very end, the fact that he gets all promised, so you're going to forgive me and we'll be together and we'll just have this nice touching moment? And I'm writing down in my notes, and how long is this going to last? Until morning. She wakes up and finds out nobody else is there. Of course. So, again, a little interesting dynamic going on between dad and daughter. Obviously, she's going to be running after him as he's trying to get to whatever point that he needs to. But there was an inter another interesting idea here dropped in, and it was William's memory problems. Uh, now, it could just be the sign of an inattentive father uh, who wasn't really there for his family, confusing the fact that it wasn't his daughter, it wasn't Grace who was scared of elephants, it was the mom who was scared of elephants. Always thought this place could, could hurt someone. But the confusion on William's face just reminded me a lot of uh, the other, uh, of, of uh, Delos and his little memory problems and remembering things. It, it seemed to be a lack of fidelity, that maybe something is off in the programming, i.e., is William himself a host? Is he William in a host's body? And of course, that becomes a really important question as everything lays out. It becomes, it's interesting, as the episode opened up and we're seeing that the conversation between Dolores and Arnold is really between Dolores and Bernard or Arnold in a bot, which always felt like there might be some time differential there the past few times that we've seen it. Here, I love that it plays out a little bit more. But she's talking to Bernard about testing fidelity. It's the same conversation that William had with Delos. We've had this conversation Many, many times, countless times, I am checking for fidelity. I'm running through a series of questions to see if the personality can hold on. So obviously Bernard in the future is a bot that is programmed. Is it Arnold inside of Bernard? Is that what Dolores is testing? And therefore, is William here actually a host? Possibly not to say it's easily understood. It's, easy, it's easily explained because of just an inattentive father. They've certainly set that up that he hasn't always been there for his family. He's been obsessed and absolved in with the park. But I, it's just something to put in the back of the mind. Just keep an eye of I, uh, an eye on William and see if Ford's quest for William is for him to escape, kind of like it is for Dolores. But yes, Ford, alive and inside the cradle, or the CR4DL, as the door said. Uh, interesting, I love the little sequence, I love the build up to that, going into the mesa, the trail of white and black hats into the interior. I, just, I thought that was really cool because it was almost like white hat, black hat, white hat, black hat, white hat, black hat, leading into the room where everybody makes their choices and does all of that. It's just an interesting overlay of Death and destruction on both sides, on the good and the bad. It was just, again, a lot of great visual storytelling uh, in with this show. But we get to the idea of the cradle, that something is wrong in there, that there is something that is actively fighting off all the attempts to intrude and change the programming. Sounds totally like an AI. And then we have Bernard jumping right in. And again, Wonderful sequence. We're still dealing with those elements of choice. This is Bernard's choice to dive in. We have Elsie, a human, and now at this point we can think that she is human because of the little control chip that Bernard got. Seemed to have been actually Ford's control chip that he then put into the cradle, and that's what's allowed all of this to go. But we have Elsie, who's apparently a human, from all intents and purposes, choosing to work with Bernard. A Bernard, a host, choosing to work with the humans and having that faith and trust on both ends. I love how Bernard's just ready to jump right in to the, uh, to the cradle, into the hive mind there. Uh, was it pain is just a program. I, mean, I love that character. It just, again, it's handled beautifully. There's no time for any of this. Uh, but dives right in, the mainframe being a layout just inside the park like everything else. Who do you search for inside? The one that doesn't belong. And who doesn't belong? Of course, Ford. 
Well, the dog. I don't think we don't have a dog in Westworld that I've seen before. So that must have been what grabbed uh, Bernard's mind. So that must have been the control chip that Bernard was remembering to make was the control chip for Ford, which of course means that they have successfully integrated the machine and the people. That what we saw with Delos isn't accurate for the tech. And is this something that Ford has always been able to do and has denied Delos the ability to do? I mean, we've had Bernard in the computer here believing that, or Arnold in the form of Bernard, but acting as, in some ways, Arnold without the memory of who that is. Um, is he a host or is he an AI? Or is he Arnold actually in Bernard's body working through some sort of filter? At this point, we can definitely believe that Ford has been transferred into a control chip, into that immortal form, digitized, because he is now in the hive fighting off everything and orchestrating everything and feeding and doing all the kind of master control work. Um, so this is, again, this is the next step. If they're able to permanently ingrain and have this be stable, have high fidelity where things do not fall apart, then we'll be able to transfer people into hosts or hosts can pretend to be people, which I think is, again, what Dolores' ultimate goal is. All right, just a couple of small things. Uh, timeline, we are a week into all of the events. We know this happens over a two-week spread, so we are halfway through uh, this storytelling, and we're halfway through the season. So everything is working out on pace. I love the little bow of respect between Hector and Masashi before they parted. Obviously, these are two characters that have been butting heads, don't necessarily like each other, are suspicious because... They're effectively the same person, but they left with that respectful note. And again, very much summed up how Maeve's group interacts with everyone. A spiking Abernathy to the chair, that was just wrong. I mean, even Stubbs thought that was crossing over the line. Uh, cold Teddy handing the technician an empty gun and one bullet. And that's the extent of his mercy. Yeah. Cold Teddy. Uh, interesting how the park systems are all registering as everything working normal, despite all the bodies around. And I guess, in effect, it is, if host killing people is normal. But they, you know, elevators work. All right, well, I think that pretty much covers everything. So next week, Dolores and company enter the Mesa. And Maeve finally has her daughter. Is she going to get out? And is she going to be able to access some of that memory? Have an actual relationship? Or is it just freeing another host? We will find out next week. But thank you so much for joining me here. Really do appreciate it. And if you enjoyed this review, please go ahead and hit that like button. Thoughts, ideas, and comments, throw those right down in the section below. You can always catch me on Twitter and Instagram. I am at Darren Jakes. Please subscribe. If you're not quick, it's easy. One button press. You catch all of these reviews. Got the rest of the season. Plus, we're doing Legion, Preacher this summer. Lots of stuff. We'll throw a couple of reviews you can actually check out right there. So, that's going to be it for me. I'm D, and I'm out of here. Catch you guys next time. Bye-bye.